Hey, what's up guys? Uh, it's Joe here at Maui Game Studio. Today we're going to talk about tips and tricks that a lot of really established and unestablished RPG makers do not use. I've seen people who have been using RPG makers for like a decade and a lot of these things they haven't put into their normal practice. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about, um, the first eight things really, are function key related. So this video could easily have been called like function key video. And it's interesting to me that I see so many people who use RPG Maker who don't even know what their function keys do. So we're going to go through that and that's actually going to be the first eight things on our list here. So the, I'm also going to go in order of the function key number. So if it's like F1, it's going to be first. And if it's F12, it'll be last. So the first function key we're going to talk about is F2, which it again, it boggles my mind that so many people uh, don't know what this does. It's full screen there. And I'm in my game here in my test page. Um, if you look at the top left, watch the top left of the screen. So you, did you see that change? It changes to MS and then it disappears, right? So F2 is your first thing you need to learn here. What F2 does is it toggles between three choices. One, the frame menu is going to be off. Two is your FPS, your frames per second. And then if you push F2 again, it'll show your refresh time. So the MS is for milliseconds and that's how many milliseconds it takes for you to update your frame. So at this rate, it's I get an update every two milliseconds and it kind of varies between two and four, which is rounded. It's not exactly two, but uh, you know, it's that would be two millisecond refresh rate is about 60 frames-ish. It Four is about 59. So obviously you can tell it's rounded because it'll never hit three ever, at least not an RPG maker. You can also see up there in the top left that it says WebGL mode. I'm not sure if you can read it. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll jump in OBS and magnify a bit for you. So you can see that it says WebGL right there, and that just means that it's using WebGL to render. RPG Maker also does work with Canvas. I've pretty much set up my game so it uses WebGL exclusively. Again, F2 off, FPS, and then millisecond refresh rate. Very important. Okay, let's get on to our next thing, is F3. And this is one that's kind of underused, but from a pixel art perspective, it's very useful. So looking at my game now, my game actually runs in 720p, and when I drop down and I push F3 here, you can see that the pixels are much more kind of clean, they're more concise. So what's happening now when I push F3 is it's showing me a pixel for pixel ratio to my screen's resolution. If I had a 720p monitor, for example, this would be full screen. If you have a 4K monitor and you use this setting, it will also scale your pixels so that they will be in basically the, the closest denominator. So I'm not going to show you, but on my 4K monitor, it's a different size because it does two pixels per one pixel in my game or three pixels for that matter. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, ask me in the comments. But basically it just scales so that you have a one for one, one for two, one for three ratio to the pixels in your game. And if you were here sitting watching this computer, it might even be the case for the video, you can see they're like a lot more crisp and you can see kind of every single pixel. Where, if, where with this, we have a lot more anti-aliasing happening in the game. So that's F3, On to the next, F4. Now this is one that I've already been using in the video, but F4 makes it full screen. Now this is super important during testing, and you can also see with the combination of F4 versus F3, it'll make it full screen to the closest denominator. So for F4, just when you're testing, for me this is important primarily for streaming, to be honest, because I don't really care about it being windowed when it's on my computer, but when I stream, or I'm doing a video like this, I use F4 so that you can see what the heck is going on in my game. By the way, I just updated my um, walking sprites. You can see they have a walking animation and a running animation. Looking pretty cool. So as a side note, that's something to kind of look forward to in the future. 
anyway, so we've done F2, F3, F4. Now it's time to do F5. Now let's see what F5 does. Oh, what happened? My game reset. I resetted my game. Oh, resetted it again. Now this is very key if you're testing something specific and you want it to revert. See, like for example, I have that little crab that I talked to and he makes my sprites bigger. And this is good when I'm testing so that I can see them. But say I don't want to have them big again, I can just go ahead and reset the game. Beautiful, magical, right? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So F5 is the reset button. And a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people will just close the window and reopen. Look at all that time I just wasted. I just wasted like 10 seconds. Now multiply that by like the you know, million times that you're, <laughs> that you're literally going to reset the game while you're testing. And you've created a, a, a lot of wasted time. The number four thing on our list is use F5 to restart. And I guess I don't need to explain that anymore because it's somewhat self-explanatory. Uh, the next two, uh, there's two keys. And I think the reason they make it available on two keys is because sometimes function keys are used for other things within Windows or within the Mac OS. Um, and they want to really make sure that you can access it. But uh, to, to access this, we use both F8 and F12, and they do the same thing. So we'll push F8 first, and this is the console log. There's also some other good stuff you can get from here, and F12. And look at that, the exact same thing. So for this, for example, let me, uh, let me restart with my F5, and I'm going to push F8 again. You can see when you're testing. Now, this is a little bit of more of an advanced topic, but if you're debugging your game, you can see, like, I just did that, and I have a bunch of console logs that fired. Um, I don't want to go too into console logs or whatever, but sometimes, even if you're not doing, like, advanced stuff, you can see through errors in here that a particular plugin, for example, might be causing your game to crash. And then you might decide maybe not to use the plugin if you're kind of an intro user. If you're a more advanced user, um, like me, haha, <laughs> you'll go in and you'll edit that plugin or you'll add an additional plugin that will override that plugin to fix whatever error is happening in your game. So this is always a great tool. And, and it's honestly just good to get familiar with using the RPG Maker dev tools because eventually you're going to want to fix things or do things that are a bit more advanced. I'm not going to go into using the console log. If, I want, if you guys want that, make sure to let me know in the comments. But as for now, like, just know that it's there and just know that it'll help you. Okay, so the next one, uh, number six on our list here is a handy tool that helps you control variables and switches. So if you push F9, pushing F9 here, you can see switches 1 through 100 and then variables 1 through 100. Now, it's important to point out here that I actually have more switches and variables than that. And if I change my maximum here to, to 200 variables and then I reopen my game, push F9 again, you can see the variables will actually increase all the way to 200. So whatever variables you have in your game and switches, you can control them here. Sometimes I might want to test a specific variable that was is triggered in the game. Maybe it's like, a, you know, killing a certain amount of guys or switches, you know, that will allow me to get through certain parts. This is just key for testing. A lot of people will just temporarily create an event in their game to trigger the game being the player being at like a certain place in the game. I uh, highly recommend against that. I recommend that you use F9 to go through and change whatever switches when you're testing. Because at least if you're anything like me and you create an event in a map that will trigger a certain switch, that it's only a matter of time before you forget to remove it and you push your game live to Steam or the Android store or the iOS app store and you totally make your game broken and have a hard lock in the game and you get a million negative reviews and you know everybody uh, and then you go to prison and yeah it just gets bad from there so my suggestion would be to not use events in your game to test certain markers to to adjust switches and variables If you hold control here, you can walk through things. Not holding control, holding control. There's water here. You can do the Jesus, not holding control, holding control. So when you're testing the game, 
being able to walk through objects a lot of times will save you a lot of time. Uh, maybe you got to get through a map and you just want to get across it really quick and not walk around some kind of complicated labyrinth like maze. Um, also, uh, it's worth noting that you will still take damage from ground damage, which I rarely use in my game. I have it kind of as an Easter egg here and there. But if you walk through here, you know, you still lose health. The next thing we're going to do is going to be in the map editor. And this is something that I think a lot of people who do map making don't know about. I've actually watched videos of people I respect um, who are just really amazing RPG maker creators. And they don't even know about this. So let's go ahead and do it. So if I'm creating tiles here, right, and I hold shift, I can actually have control over whatever specific tile I want to use. So if I want this specific corner tile, and then I want this corner tile here, and then I want this corner tile, and maybe this corner tile, I can use it specifically. And it becomes very powerful in MZ, which I'm in now. All of this stuff works for M MV until what I'm going to say right now. But you can control the specific um, layer that you go on. So if I wanted to make some grass on the water, for example, I could hold shift like this, put it on the top layer, and then I can put grass on top of the, well, on top of the water like that, you see? So you can kind of have this kind of control over the map. And you can kind of mess with it a bit, you know, like if I wanted to, for example, just have one piece like that, I could do it like this. See, I can't do it on that same layer, but if I put it on the top layer here, I can create some interesting things by overlaying certain um, tiles, especially ones that have, you know, negative space in them over the certain parts of the map. So, you know, if I want to keep the one thing and not have it tile, as opposed to something like this, you know, you just have a little bit more control over, you know, what's going on. So just, you can kind of fool around with it and figure it out. Maybe use some empty space here. Um, to kind of right click and copy it and then push it over and see how it affects depending on what layer you're on and get like different results. This is already like, obviously this isn't very polished, but you can kind of see the potential of what you could do by holding shift when you're in the tile map setting. So that's our eighth thing. Let's get on to our ninth and 10th thing here. Here, this is kind of like, I've avoided using any plugins so far, but this is one thing that I think that I watch a lot with other people, and it kind of frustrates me. This is a specific plugin I use. Um, Q plugin is like a plugin suite. It's kind of like Yanfly. There's just less of them. But I just use the base plugin here, which is Q+. I'll leave a link to this in the, uh, in the description of this video. Another plugin that you can do this with is SRD's his debugger plugin. I prefer Q+, just because it's a little bit more simple and it doesn't do a lot of things that I don't want it to do. If you get this plugin, you can just turn on and off your quick test. So if I set this to false, for example, which I never do, it'll make it so that I see the title screen. If you guys noticed in the video so far, we go straight to the map right, that I'm on. And then in order to, to, to show my title screen, and also when I put my game live, I just turn off the Q plus plugin like this. And then, so now if I go over here and I go set starting position and I start the game, we're gonna see my title screen pop up. And so when the game is live, and I'm not just having it out for testing, this is what I want the player to see. And then if they go new game, then they'll come to this map that I just kind of destroyed. It might seem like a little thing to have to go through that menu, but when you are testing your game and you're setting stuff up and you're trying to figure stuff out, uh, it's just going to save you, you know, like five seconds, but it'll be times like a thousand times. So, it, you know, that time adds up and, you know, just having a plugin that you can toggle on and off in the same time that it would take you to go through the menu is going to just be very advantageous. You know, so highly recommend, highly, highly, highly recommend using Q plus or some kind of equivalent plugin to do that job. The last thing we're going to talk about is eventing related. And um, I, I, I don't know why, but I know that a lot of people, when they're making their events, they don't leave comments for themselves. And this becomes especially important when you're doing 
uh, collaborative stuff. But I really, 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 really recommend using comments in your code, especially if your project is going to last longer than a year. You're going to come back later and you're just going to be like, I don't know what I was doing in this event. I don't understand what's going on. I mean, the code is there, so you can kind of figure it out. But if you have comments that kind of give you a little bit more insight into what you were trying to do, not only will it be easier for other people, but if you're like me and you just forget stuff, it's going to help you a lot more. So just add comments wherever you can, you know. You can always remove them if you felt like you were too superfluous in your comments. This also works in RPG Maker MV, right? See if I create an event here, I can add comments as well. So either way, it works for both. All right, guys. That concludes our 10 tips and tricks for RPG Maker. Make sure you leave a comment below, subscribe, hit the like button whatever else you can do to support me join the discord we're talking about this kind of stuff all the time in there love to hear from you would love to hear your thoughts if you want any other videos similar to this if you like this video please let me know you know it takes a lot of time and effort to get motivated to make these videos so i know you appreciate it so uh just show that a little bit and help me out i'll talk to you all later love ya aloha from maui bye bye bye